following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. joining us on yet another episode of a special presentation here on Other There in a 24. Now today's topic is something that a lot of us are not completely unfamiliar with and that's on cancer. I know this is a topic that we have spoken about quite extensively as well over a range of our programs but we haven't really delved into the specifics considering you know the different types of cancers, how different types of cancers are treated and to speak about this very vast topic we have two individuals that I believe will be able to most accurately give us uh, descriptions and a bit of explanation to our audience. Uh, Dr. Tanuja Rajasekaran, Senior Consultant, Medical Oncology, and Dr. Dawn Mia, Senior Consultant, Hematology, both from the Parkway Cancer Center. Thank you very much, doctors, for taking the time to speak to us on this very timely and very important topic. Now, uh, of course, without any further ado, let's get right into the discussion because there's a lot for us to unpack. Dr. Dawn, I'd like to start with you. Now, we understand that you are a hematologist, but what exactly is a hematologist? I'm sure our audience would like to know. We understand it's something to do with the blood, but how exactly does that entail in the oncology aspect? Could you explain to us, doctor? Sure. So a hematologist, um, who is also uh, can be known as a blood specialist, takes care of uh, patients with blood cancers as well as other blood disorders. So blood cancers um, include acute leukemias, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, so basically, hematologists take care, uh, takes care of patients uh, who are suffering from these um, diseases. And at the same time, other blood disorders like anemia or bleeding disorders or clotting issues uh, will also fall under hematology. Right. So there is quite a vast area that hematologists will be expected to treat and to understand. So it's not just very specific for oncology, I'm understanding. Even though this topic is a little bit too focused on oncology, I believe that's a good way for us to actually get an introduction to you as well, Dr. Tanuja. Now, you're a medical oncologist. We understand that medical oncology is a very vague term for us to understand. Okay, there's something to do with cancer, but what exactly do you do, doctor? Do you specifically specialize in a certain area of oncology? How does that work? Okay, so uh, thank, first, first of all, thank you for having me with you on this show. So I'll explain to you what a medical oncologist does. So we start off with the bigger picture first. So can cancer care is very complex. So whenever we have a cancer patient, there are many uh, specialists involved in the care of the patient. So there can be surgeons to operate on the patient. And then there would, those will be called the surgical oncologists. And there, myself, I'm a medical oncologist. And so what I do is I deal with systemic therapy. So systemic therapy essentially includes anything like chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, hormonal therapy. So all this comes under my realm, anything that involves systemic therapy. And then we have another group of doctors called radiation oncologists and they are in they they deal with radiation. Right. right. So I, I hope that explains what a medical yeah, oncologist does. It quite does, but it does also open a little bit of a question of curiosity as well, Doctor. Now we see a lot of people thinking, okay, we do chemo and we do radiotherapy as well, radiation. Um, do you believe that the aspect that you are specialized in is more of a primary factor when it comes to cancer care? Or do you believe that radiation therapy and uh, you know, chemotherapy and other systemic therapies are actually a joint effort? Do you believe one has a little bit more prevalence over the other? No. So I think, firstly, it depends on the type of cancer that you're dealing with. In certain, in certain cancers, for example, let's say we talk about breast cancer, which is the most common cancer in females. So usually it's starts off with a lady discovering that she has a lump in the breast and then she usually goes to a surgeon who then uh, biopsies the lump and should she require some form of surgery that is dealt with by the surgeon and thereafter the patient is sent to someone like myself, a medical oncologist who would administer systemic therapy which is could be a combination of chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, targeted therapy and thereafter if the patient requires radiation therapy then I send the patient to the radiation oncologist. So it is not that that one subspecialty is more important than the other. It's just, it's just that we all work together to make sure that the patient gets well. 
Right, it's a collaborative effort. Absolutely. I feel like that has a lot of, that's a lot of clarification for our audience as well, because a lot of people believe, okay, so don't get chemo, go for radiation therapy, but really they don't have a medical degree and they're just suggesting certain things. It's very important to understand that it's a, a team effort for us to save the patient at the end of the day. Well, Dr. Dawn, uh, I believe I've been ignoring you for far too long, doctor. I think this question could be best answered by you. Doctor, now we understand there are different types of cancers, hematological cancers or cancers of the blood, uh, which our audience might be aware of, leukemia being the most common. So what do you believe is the key difference between hematological cancers and solid cancers, so lumps and tumors? Uh, could you explain to us, doctor? Yeah, so basically, you know, since you mentioned acute leukemia, I'll just give you an example. So blood cancers, acute leukemia, it originates from the blood cells, right? And blood cells circulate throughout our circulatory system in the blood vessels. So when, it, when these blood cells uh, turn into cancerous cells, they will go everywhere, okay? So basically, uh, in simple words, it can be, you can also call it as liquid cancer. Yeah, so it flows everywhere. So at the diagnosis, it is everywhere. So basically in blood cancers, there are no uh, specific staging like solid cancers. So solid cancers, when it originates from a, an, an organ, for example, lungs or breast, and then if it spreads to other areas, so there, there, there will be stages, yeah? stage one, you know, to uh, higher stages. Whereas blood cancers, once it starts, it starts in the blood, it goes everywhere. So it is very difficult you know, for, us, for us to stage the condition. And basically, uh, the treatments, you know, how we treat the patients and the chemotherapy, the drugs that we use will be different you know, from um, uh, the, the treatment options available for the blood uh, solid tumours. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Doctor, a question of curiosity before I move on to Dr. Tanaja to speak about solid state uh, cancers as well and tumours. Uh, do you believe that there is an increased potency in hematological cancers? Because you said it's liquid cancer. Technically, it has affected every area, every aspect of your body. Do you believe compared to solid cancers and tumours, there is more of a lethality to hematological cancers? Yeah, so it really depends on the types. So if you are talking about acute leukemias, yes, they are considered one of the aggressive cancers. And um, in comparison to you know, other uh, types of cancers, probably um, the, the potency you know, that you mentioned can be quite high. You know, basically, it can be very aggressive. It can progress very rapidly. And without treatment, it can be very highly lethal. Yeah? Whereas there are um, some low-grade blood cancers as well and some slowing, uh, slow-growing uh, blood cancers as well. So there are different types. So that is why the at diagnosis to get the correct subtype of cancer is very important, you know, be it solid, tumor can uh, solid tumors or liquid tumors. Right. Now, uh, Dr. Tanuja, I'd like to move on. Uh, we just learned about exactly how uh, the cancer of the blood will affect a human being in different ways. So, Dr. Solid cancers, tumours, I'm sure a lot of us have some form of generalised knowledge regarding tumours, especially with uh, how completely popular it is, it is specifically you know, in mediums of uh, entertainment and media that people consume, there's a lot, oh, okay. So there is a bit of a lethality that comes with tumours, but we understand that that's not exactly the case. There is a lot of nuances. So could you explain to us, doctor, how exactly does medical oncology approach solid cancers? Okay, so solid, basically whenever we talk about solid organ cancers, it, it is it's very wide ranging. So it's basically any organ in, the, in your body, right? So you, have, you can have liver cancers, you can have uh, colorectal cancers, breast cancers, lung cancers, uh, genital urinary cancers. Um, so it's, it's really a wide, uh, there's a wide range of cancers and how we stage each of this cancer is also different, right? So whenever, for example, let's say the top three cancers, for example, let's say in uh, females, right? Usually it's uh, breast, colorectal and lung cancer, for example. And how we treat each of these cancers and how we stage them are completely different. And sometimes because the uh, in, in medical oncology, the field of medical oncology is growing so, so fast and, and most of the time, like medical oncologists, we tend to subspecialize in. A, so we, we we all of us do general oncology, but we like for example myself, I subspecialize for a particular group of cancers like lung cancers, genital urinary cancers, head and neck, and breast cancer. So these are the cancers that I see more frequently compared to the others. 
Right. And doctor, before I move on to Dr. Dawn to speak about this specific area as well, when it comes to treatment, now this is an area that is quite controversial because a lot of people understand that they are now Honestly, it's one of the safest times to actually contract cancer, God forbid, uh, in this uh, new time frame, in this era. So, when it comes to treatment, doctor, how wide-ranging and how vast is the actual landscape right now when it comes to modern cancer treatments? Okay, so that, that's a great question and you are absolutely right about cancer becoming more prevalent. In fact, the statistics say that basically one in three or one in four people in our lifetime will get cancer. So potentially between the three of us, one of us could be afflicted with cancer. But the good news is that even if you are afflicted with cancer, um, there are many can, cancer treatment has advanced greatly that nowadays we don't see cancer as a terminal disease but more, of, more as a chronic disease. So when we talk about treatment options, I think the biggest advancement in cancer in general is uh, precision medicine. So basically, it, in the past, whenever we say lung cancer, all the lung cancers are treated in the same way. But now it is not like that. So what, what we are able to do is we are basically able to do molecular tests uh, to see exactly what is the gene that is driving the cancer. And we are able to, be, um, we are able to use drug that specifically targets that particular gene. So let's say if you have three people who have lung cancer, all three of them may be receiving different treat different forms of treatment. Someone may be receiving targeted therapy, another person may be receiving chemotherapy, someone else may be receiving chemo plus immunotherapy. So it's never it's a never one size fits all anymore. It's really truly precision medicine treating a, treating a particular uh, patient and the particular cancer um, in, in the best possible way. Right, so it's really tailor-made now and we really have quite little to worry about when it comes to specifying our cancer treatments as well. We've come quite a long way, uh, as you've just mentioned, uh, from previous methods and how it's not generalized at all. That's really good to hear as well. Uh, Dr. Dawn, moving on to you. Now, when it comes to hematological cancers, we understand that there's well, we have the same subtypes, we have the same areas and means of treatment. How exactly does it differ from uh, solid state cancers uh, for the treatment aspects? Could you explain to us, doctor? Yeah, so in terms of the basic concepts of the treatment, I would say it's rather similar. Uh, there are you know, different kinds of uh, options available, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapies, like what Dr. Tanuja has mentioned. But just that, of course, the targets okay, for immunotherapy or the targets for targeted therapy can be different, right? Because they are different types of cancers. So the targets available on the blood cancer cells will be different from the solid tumor cells. So the drugs will be different. So the drugs that we use you know, to uh, kill the blood cancer cells will be different from solid tumor um, uh, drugs for example okay and um, in terms of you know another um, difference that I would like to mention is uh, in terms of the treatment for acute leukemias since I've mentioned acute leukemia is a very aggressive cancer the treatment has to be very intensive as well you know to uh, really get rid of this kind of um, uh, aggressive cancer cells so usually treatment is intensive the patients has to, uh, they have to you know spend a longer time period you know in the hospital undergoing intensive chemotherapy um, uh, with the central lines you know so in, in terms of that aspect can be a little different because I understand nowadays uh, many solid tumors uh, patients they are treated as uh, in the you know outpatient centers whereas um, majority of the acute leukemia patients they still have have to be admitted to the hospital you know have to stay uh, for a period of time in the hospital and uh, spend uh, to, to receive the intensive chemotherapy and only after um, achieving some form of you know remission then they will be uh, go, they will go home and then they can continue uh, subsequent maintenance therapy uh, probably as an outpatient yeah all right well that is quite the uh, very specific description i feel like our audience would have really understood the key differences between treating the different types of cancer. Just as you mentioned, doctor, there is a lot of collaborative effort, I believe, when it comes to uh, cancer and working between different fields and different specialties. If you could explain to us, Dr. Tanuj, I'd like to direct this to you. Uh, medical oncologists and hematologists, how often is there collaborative efforts when it comes to taking care of cancer patients? Is it uh, 
a, a full-time collaboration might as well have the same departments in the same building or do you believe that it's more of a separated but when it comes to dire circumstances there has to be collaboration how does that work doctor? so so generally like for medical oncologists and hematologists we work together quite quite frequently so in in my case for for example so if I would give you an example so let's say I'm treating a patient with a for for example lung cancer and this patient runs into trouble for example the blood counts falls very low uh, hemoglobin is very low patient has anemia or for example the platelets are very low or patient has a uh, blood clots and then so for if you know if the patient run into uh, complications that are related to the blood then I would refer the patient to Dr. Dawn and she would gladly then uh, help me to manage these complications and also for my patient they, they are getting like the best of both worlds right so I mean for me my speciality is medical oncology and so I know all about that but when it comes to, 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 the, to the areas of the blood my knowledge may not be that great and so and that's where Dawn who's the expert would help me to manage the condition. Right, so there is a lot of collaboration when it comes to it. Uh, Dr. Don, before we move into a break, we don't have quite a bit of time. Now, when it comes to early detection as well, I feel like we might have to move this on, uh, continue this very packed question on to the next segment as well. But before we do, Doctor, when it comes to the actual early detection and you know improving the already existing condition of the patient, do you believe that the current means that are in place is adequate? Do you believe that we respond quickly enough to detections of cancer? Uh, early detection, of course, is very important, you know, because um, only very uh, certain specific types of cancers can be prevented. Okay, in the first place. So otherwise, majority of the cancers are diagnosed um, probably only when it happens, right, rather than uh, at the prevention stage. Okay, so um, only when it happens, we will know it. So uh, if we detect it earlier, then uh, of course the treatment can be administered earlier. And at that point in time, the patients may be, uh, the patient will still be fit you know, to undergo whatever treatment the patient, uh, the, he or she has to receive. So um, it is always good to have this early detection of the cancer, okay, so that, you know, necessary intervention can be done uh, as early as possible and um, the patient is still, you know, fit to undergo all the, you know, uh, optimal kind of treatment. Right, well, I feel like that is uh, an ideal uh, place to leave off this uh, segment on. Uh, before we discuss, there's quite a lot for us to unpack as well for the specifics of treatment and also patient care in general and the future of um, oncology and the treatment of cancers. Before we do any of that, let's do a very short commercial break. You're watching Special Presentation. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You are watching special presentation on Other Dharana 24. We were just talking about cancer with Dr. Tanuja Rajasekharan, senior consultant, medical oncology from the Parkway Cancer Center, and also Dr. Dawn Mia from uh, senior consultant, hematology from the Parkway Cancer Center as well. We just left off on, I believe, a very packed discussion, a very packed topic, uh, just getting right into the nitty gritties of the differences and the nuances of treatment and also detection. I think it's important for us to pick up on something. Dr. Tanaji, you mentioned this in the previous segment as well. When it comes to the customization of treatment for a specific individual, for cancer patients, do you believe that the current landscape that we have when it comes to, you know, personalization of cancer treatments, is it adequate? Do you believe that there's room for improvement um, or maybe some form of differentiation specifically when it comes to collaboration between hematology and oncology as well? Do you believe there's more that can be done or are we at a good place right now? So again, a uh, great question. So I think you're absolutely right. We have come, we, we have done quite a bit in terms of precision medicine and or, in terms of making sure that we treat patients uh, according, according to their particular cancer type, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. So currently there's still lots of research go ongoing into various different cancers to see whether we can find um, particular targetable mutations that we can specifically target. So in lung cancer, this has grown widely, but in some other cancers, this is not this has this has not happened. So for example, in colorectal cancer, which is one of the most common cancers uh, among males and females.
females in most developed countries. Uh, we're still using traditional chemotherapy with a little bit of targeted therapy, but we still need, there's still a long way to go. So uh, there's a lot of ongoing research into finding particular targets that uh, potentially can, that can be drugged with, um, with, with, chemo, with um, oncological treatment. Right, so there is, while we are at an okay place right now, there's there is much more, quite to be done. more to be done. Right, so that's quite a point of discussion as well. So Dr. Don, I'd like to direct that question to you as well. What are your thoughts when it comes to the current landscape for customizing cancer treatment for individuals? Do you also believe that there is so much more to be done or do you believe in the field of hematological cancers? Are we at a good place? What do you think, doctor? Yes, definitely. So with um, a lot of advances in the technology and in this medical field, uh, like you have mentioned, uh, there are a lot of you know, personalized, uh, uh, individualized therapy. So I'll give you an example, which is this uh, newer type of therapy called CAR T cells. So basically, uh, patients' uh, immune cells called T cells patients own T-cells, so that is the most individualized that it can be, right? And these T-cells can be um, uh, manufactured, you know, as a drug product, and that can be used in the same patients, okay? So that is really an individualized therapy to treat relapsed uh, refractory leukemia cases or lymphoma cases, okay? But then again, there are still a lot of challenges and limitations, you know, in terms of cost, in terms of the accessibility, and um, um, the, the manufacturing, the, the time that, you know, that while the drug is being manufactured, the patients, they have to wait, you know, um, uh, and, and during that waiting time, the disease can actually progress. And sometimes um, um, it may reach a state where before the drug is uh, available, the, uh, we probably have to, the disease has progressed and we probably have to use other options, you know. So it's still, um, we have come very far, but still um, there are you know, more rooms to improve. And, right, and specifically yeah. when it comes to that golden time frame as yes, well, in order to yes, treat a cancer yes, it's in yes. its you know, initial yeah. stages. Yeah. It's a race against time, of course. Any disease yeah. might be, but yeah. uh, specifically mm -hmm. cancer mm -hmm. as well. Uh, yes, of course, please. Yeah, just to add, because uh, you know, like, like Dawn was talking about CAR T cell in blood cancers. In fact, uh, CAR T cell therapy in solid organ is something that is an ongoing area of research. So potentially, imagine, I mean, imagine in a few down down the road where you can have your own your take off your take out your tumor cells, so a T cells from your body and expose them to the cancer cell that is within your own body, and then engineer your T cells to be able to fight that cancer cell. That is something that uh, is potentially being um, researched on. And if once that becomes a reality, then that would be something very amazing. That is truly personalized medicine. Right, you're flooding and a patient's body with their own cells so that's about as you're engineering it's you your own uh, immune cells to fight the cancer that is in your own body exactly right? yeah. so that could be the peak of uh treatment for solid cell and cancers as well, I'm understanding. I feel like this is a good segue for us to get into the immunotherapy aspect as well. Uh, Dr. Tanuja, could you please explain to us now, you mentioned CAR T cells, of course, as Dr. Dawn did as well. So there is a pioneering research that we are currently undergoing right now, although it hasn't come into complete fruition, it's still underway and there are good signs. Immunotherapy, do you believe that it will continue to progress and advance? Do you believe the current state that we are in could be improved by certain uh, research or not just research, maybe practices that we can implement now? Uh, or do you think that we are in an okay place for immunotherapy? Do you believe? So, I mean, when, when, I, when I first started my oncology training, there was no such thing as um, immunotherapy. Is, okay, it's not there's no such thing as immunotherapy, but immunotherapy as what we know of was not present at that time. And immunotherapy is something that's fairly new. So whenever we talk about immunotherapy, immunotherapy is like a big umbrella and there are many things under immunotherapy. Cancer vaccine, cell therapy, oncolytic cell, uh, ther uh, cell therapies. But the main thing that has really taken the oncological world by storm is checkpoint, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And, and that has truly changed uh, cancer landscape. So previously, with this immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, 
previously like cancers that were considered to, met, to be metastatic, to be stage 4, the cancers that were thought to be incurable, now potentially have a chance to be cured with the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Basically, how immune checkpoint inhibitors work is essentially activating your own immune system, harnessing your own immune system to fight the cancer cells. And so in that, from that point of view, over, over the last uh, eight years or so, we've come a long way in terms of uh, what, what, we, what we have done with immunotherapy, but there's still a long way to go. And there are, there's much research into um, immunother different immunotherapeutic agents. Yeah, and, right. and over the next 10 years or so, I, I expect to see many, many more advancements. That's really good news as well for us to hear that even metastatic cancers, stage 4 cancers, you know, that's a terminal diagnosis for a lot of people. It's just, you know, spend what time you can with your family uh, kind of diagnosis. But now to hear that in a decade or so, we could actually have a fighting chance against even uh, stage 4 cancer is quite good news as well. Uh, Dr. Dawn, I'd like to direct now a follow-up question regarding this specific topic as well. Do you believe that in with when it comes to hematological cancers, immunotherapy, I believe that is very integrative work because, you know, we work with the same medium that the cancer exists in. So could you explain to us, uh, Doctor, how drastically has immunotherapy affected the outcome for patients in the current sphere? Time? Yes, yes. Definitely, immunotherapy is a very, very important treatment option in, uh, um, for blood cancers. So basically, um, stem cell transplant, I'm sure uh, you have heard about you know, this bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant. It is a form of immunotherapy. You know? So um, the, um, they are like autologous stem cell transplant using the patient's own uh, stem cells or allogenic stem cell transplant using the stem cells from a healthy donor. And even now the CAR T uh, cell therapy that I've mentioned, uh, it is a type of cell therapy, but it's still considered part of the immunotherapy as well because these T cells are immune cells, right? So basically all these cell therapies, they are very important in treating hematological conditions, especially this acute leukemia or sometimes this very aggressive lymphoma cases where chemotherapy alone is not sufficient to get rid of the cancer cells completely and you need a healthy immune system uh, to eradicate you know whatever remaining residual cells after uh, treating with chemotherapy so immunotherapy is really a very it plays a very important role in uh, treating the patients with blood cancers yeah. right of course there is while there's still development going on it seems that CAR T cells and immunotherapy specifically will take a little bit of a frontal role when it comes to fighting cancer globally well, uh, Dr. Tanuja, I'd like to move on to a little bit of a sensitive topic as well when it comes to you both work in the field of oncology, hematology and oncology respectively. So there is quite a lot of unfortunately uh, ways for us to, you know, detect cancer. Hence, we see a lot of cancers in patients. How do you approach breaking a cancer diagnosis to a patient? Okay, so I think receiving news of cancer, um, it, it's not easy for anybody, right? So as I, as I always tell my patients, if, even though I'm an oncologist and I do this every day and if I have to break and, and I break the news of cancer to patients many times a day, but if you were to tell me that I, I, I have cancer today, I mean, it would not be easy for me to receive the news as well. But I think what, what is important is besides telling the patients that they have cancer, it's also important to educate them exactly what cancer is. Most of the time we tend to be afraid of what we don't know of so I think it's important at the same time of telling them oh that oh that you've, you've gotten a cancer this is a particular stage this is a treatment that that uh, you're going to go through it's it's also important to tell them that what to expect right you you educate them on like the the treatment they're going to receive the side effects and also provide um, emotional support and uh, psychological support because um, it is really not an easy diagnosis to 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 receive and it's also a long-term journey so with, with my patients I always tell them this is not going to be an easy journey this is truly good it's probably maybe one probably be even one of the most difficult things that you do but no matter how difficult the journey is I walk this journey together with you and we'll go through this together. Yeah. That's exactly what counts as well as medical professionals. Uh, a lot of us often generalize doctors and you know medical professionals in the medical field to be a little bit unfeeling towards because 
considering the overexposure every single day, you might have to face at least one or two cancer patients, specifically uh, for medical oncology as well, since you deal with that entire aspect. But it's important for uh, the patient to actually understand that they're not alone in this process. I think, Dr. Don, that's a good way for us to uh, direct this question to you, uh, Doctor, when it comes to support systems that are in place. Uh, do you believe that the support systems that are in place right now, how how intrinsically does it actually integrate doctors and medical professionals? Do you believe that it's a very tertiary thing or is the doctor that has done the diagnosis and is in charge of patient care for this specific patient, is it an integral part of a support system rather than the treatment system? What do you think, doctor? Um, yeah, I mean, the support system, like Dr. Tanuja has mentioned, it's really important, okay? It's like uh, treating the cancer may be easy, but treating the patient may not be that easy, right? Because uh, cancer is cancer, but the patient, we have to really look at a holistic, uh, in a holistic view, and the family has to be involved, you know, and the treating team, as you mentioned, yes, doctor is important, you know, it's an integral, you know, the, the, the important role, but we also need a whole team of support, uh, like nurses and like pharmacists or even dietitians, you know, physiotherapists, uh, speech therapists, you know, a, a lot of uh, other allied health support is uh, very important in the cancer care. So to be honest, um, the cancer survival, you know, these um, recently really has improved a lot. Partly, yes, because of the development of the drugs and, you know, availability of these uh, newer therapies. But at the same time, because of the improvement of the supportive care and because of the awareness, you know, of the, uh, the, the importance of these, um, uh, the, the role of various team members, you know. So it's really a multidisciplinary uh, care, you know, uh, when it comes to the cancer care. Yeah. Right. So there is, it takes a medical village when it comes Definitely. to yes. curing cancer and keeping the patient cured. And I really uh, like what you just mentioned, doctor, where, you know, treating the cancer might be very direct and very easy, but it's it, at the end of the day, it's the patient that will undergo all of those treatments. Therefore, it's important to keep the mind and body healthy. Dr. Tanuja, in your experience over the years, have you seen supportive care drastically improve? Do you think there's lapses in supportive care that we can actually fill in? Uh, what do you think, doctor? So definitely supportive care has improved uh, leaps and bounds compared to you know, 10, 20 years ago when probably was, is, it may, may not even have been existent. So supportive care can be in, it, it comes in many ways. So firstly, can, supportive care can come from in the form of treatment as well. So last time, I mean, if you, if you ask anybody when you talk about chemotherapy, right? So people always have the uh, impression that it's a person with no hair vomiting away by, you know, just stuck uh, uh, over a bowl, just throwing up. But it's not like that anymore, right? Because our supportive care, our supportive treatment for uh, chemotherapy. So nowadays, we've got such good anti-nausea, anti-vomiting medication. So patients are really well supported through their treatment. Side effects are very well managed. But in terms, uh, and then that also comes to the aspect of um, emotional support. And ca cancer can sometimes be life-changing in, in many ways. So for example, if I'm a young female and I've undergone breast cancer and I've had a mastectomy. So basically, my body has changed completely and I may be on treatment that may potentially affect my fertility so Imagine if I'm a 30-year-old girl and I've now I have no breasts uh, and, and I'm on treatment, that may mean that I may not have children next time. And this has huge psychological implications and these, these need to be addressed, right? So they may have survived the cancers, but there are, there are battle scars and that, that these are things that we need to... Uh, how, how do they go back, to, go back into the society? How do they integrate back into, 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 the work, into their workspace and things like that? So I think um, that there, we've in 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 Parkway Cancer Center, we have a Can Hope, which is which is a non-profit organization that provides uh, support and they carry out activities to help um, young cancer patients or just cancer patients in general, music therapy, art therapy to support them. But um, of course, I'm sure there's more that can be done. Right. That's actually a very hopeful note for us to leave this segment off as well. Unfortunately, time is flying by. There's quite a lot to unpack. Thankfully, we have one more segment left. So I believe all the most uh, burning questions that we have for you, both doctors, we can answer in that final segment. Before we go in for a final segment, let's go into a short commercial break. You're watching special presentation. Stay with us.
Welcome back to a special presentation on Agenda 24. We are in our final segment in our discussion uh, on cancer. Uh, Dr. Tanuja Rajasekaran and Dr. Don Mia, thank you once again for those previous two segments where we had quite the insightful discussion. We had a lot of technicalities. We spoke about very, a lot of specifics when it comes to treatment and when it comes to detection as well. I feel like this segment is what the audience has been waiting for because it's specifically about detection and lifestyle changes as well. So could you please, uh, Dr. Dawn, start us off in this segment with explaining to us now, of course, cancer might be inevitable for some, it might be, you know, genetic, it might be hereditary, but there are certain things and lifestyle changes that we can, you know, for a preventative approach to lessen the blow, uh, we can do. So could you please walk us through certain lifestyle changes that you would suggest as a hematologist for cancer specifically uh, to reduce the risk of developing cancer? Yeah, yeah, you're perfectly right that, you know, there is really no specific ways that we can 100% prevent uh, cancers, including blood cancers. But there, of course, there are things that we can do uh, in general to reduce the overall risk of uh, development of cancer. So basically, uh, these are the things that we all know, you know, like smoking. Okay, it's of course, you should not smoke at all. Or if you are smoking now, you should start quitting now. Uh, you should limit the intake of alcohol, okay? It's not uh, that you can't take it at all, but you should uh, moderate it, okay? And in terms of diet, you know, food and, and, and uh, uh, other things, whatever, what, whenever the patient asks me, what I suggest is everything in moderation, okay? And must be balanced. So, uh, healthy diet, as we all know, you know, some vegetables and fruits and, you know, carbs and uh, proteins, everything, you know, in this uh, balanced proportion and, um, as much as possible, try to avoid highly processed food or, um, yeah, basically, uh, that'll be it. And uh, when it comes to exercise, uh, it is very good to stay active all the time. Uh, and um, uh, as much as possible, you know, if you, even if you can't do intensive uh, exercise, uh, you can at least try to be active by walking, you know, and, and, and clocking this uh, 10,000 Some steps. movement is yeah, better than yeah, no so, movement. Yes, definitely. Yeah, 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 so there is. Yeah, yeah. So these are the things that, you know, we should all do to basically reduce the general uh, risk of uh, getting cancer. Yeah. Right. So it might not prevent your cancer, but it could definitely help you have a stronger foundation if in case we have to battle cancer. Uh, Dr. Tanuja, I'd like to ask you the same question as well. Would you like to add to what uh, Dr. Don just mentioned about certain actions, certain lifestyle changes that we can make for uh, not necessarily prevention, but more of an improvement uh, of our physical state in order to fight cancer? So I agree, completely agree with what uh, Dr. Dawn said. So is keep a healthy weight, eat healthy, uh, exercise. But I think in addition to that, what, what we can do is, for example, there are certain things that uh, certain cancers are potentially preventable, like cervical cancers. So uh, we know that cervical cancers are caused by this virus called HPV, human papilloma virus. So it's important to get vaccinated against the virus. There's a vaccine for that. So um, it's something that you can talk to your doctor doctors about, uh, especially for the young females, uh, get them vaccinated and that can potentially prevent them from getting cervical cancer and for and, and for, um, for ladies, keep in um, keep, keep up to date with your screenings, go for your regular mammograms and your pap smears and also for, for, for the general population, regular uh, colonoscopies, uh, this is something to discuss with your um, general practitioners. Right, so we have to make sure to keep monitoring and to not be complacent with our bodies. That is, I believe, a key uh, lesson that we can all take away from because we end up becoming very you know, confident with ourselves. We've been healthy, we've been moving around, there couldn't possibly be anything wrong with us. And then out of left field, a cancer diagnosis could hit or any other illness. So I believe that's a very generalized uh, way to take care and maintain our bodies as well. Now, Dr. Dawn, I'd like to ask you, um, a bit of a question of curiosity. Do you believe that there is a certain health factor, for example, obesity or, you know, something along those lines, or maybe a lifestyle change, maybe you smoke. Have you seen which of these negative aspects of lifestyle has caused the biggest correlation to cancer detection? Do you believe that you've seen more obese individuals get diagnosed? Do you see uh, more people partaking in a certain lifestyle get diagnosed? 
Uh, from the blood cancer point of view, um, it is very hard, you know, to have a hard evidence uh, to prove that this particular factor really leads to uh, the the diagnosis of blood cancer. So it's very hard. Okay, so that is why just uh, when you um, when I answer the previous question, uh, I give a general answer, you know, to basically reduce the risk you of can't um, ge the general risk. Yeah, rather other than. Um, really pinpoint to a specific uh, causal, causal relationship, you know, between one factor to the uh, development of blood cancer. Yeah. Right. Dr. Tanaja, do you feel the same as well when it comes to solid state cancers? Yeah, there, there are risk factors generally, like as well, the common risk factors, right? Smoking, uh, obesity, um, you know, having a, a, a diet that is rich in processed food, meats and things like that. But these are risk factors. These are not causes. So patients, we, we see patients get uh, um, like for example, right, we see in lung cancer, we see smokers get lung cancer. At the same time, we see non-smokers get lung cancers as well, right? So I think it's important to, to just to have a healthy lifestyle, to decrease our risk for cancers and also to be vigilant in picking up cancers early, right? I think that's the best that we can do at this point of time. Right, uh, of course. And ironically, I just recall that, you know, a lot of people with non-alcoholic cirrhosis end up with fatal diagnoses compared to, you know, cirrhosis caused by uh, alcohol. So there's quite a lot for us to look out for despite being completely healthy. Uh, Dr. Dawn, I'd like to move on to you. Now, we just spoke about what we can do as individuals to keep ourselves healthy, to keep ourselves fit in and quite possibly negate our risks of contracting cancer or developing cancer. Could you explain to us when it comes to the cancer care landscape right now do you believe there are very significant challenges that are you know faced by individuals and also by medical practitioners when it comes to the field of cancer care are they being addressed right now um, of course the challenges always remain but um, as we have discussed before a lot of improvement um, has happened you know along the way in terms of the the specific treatment uh, for the cancers as well as the as the supportive care yeah, but of course, um, there are more things, you know, that need to be done, basically raising the awareness, you know, uh, rather than treating when the diagnosis happens, uh, how, how do we uh, keep the whole population healthy so that the whole population risk of cancer is lower. So um, raising the awareness, you know, to, uh, in terms of prevention, in terms of early detection, uh, it is very important. Yeah. And of course, when it really happens, um, like we have discussed, the supportive care in terms of uh, emotional support, you know, family family support and every aspect, okay? So um, there are a lot of things that we can do, okay? And um, it's really not one person's job. It's really the whole team and um, uh, from many aspects. Yeah. Right, as we mentioned in the previous segment, yeah. as well, it takes a village and uh, of course, once it pays off, it's quite one of the most satisfying rewards. I believe that you could get, you know, someone beat cancer. That's about as good as it gets for a person, of course. Uh, Dr. Tanuja, I'd like to ask you now, we just mentioned how it's a team effort and it has to be taken care of on all sides. Could you explain to us when it comes to holistic care? We just briefly touched on it in the previous segment as well, the integration of holistic care, like psychological support, emotional support, how how vital are these factors when it comes to recovering from cancer? Okay, so um, when with with advancements in cancer, you see that there are a lot more survivors, and so survivorship uh, care is now a big it's a big aspect in oncology. So it's um, when we talk about survivors, we besides uh, after having gone through cancer treatment successfully, there may be other um, there, there may be other uh, health implications that may occur from this. So certain chemotherapy drugs that we use, or certain hormonal treatment that that we use, may have uh, certain health conditions. So these patients need to be followed up. So that's from the medical point of view and uh, psychosocial support, integrating back uh, into society, and especially when we talk about the young people. Uh, for fertility and getting them back into the, the workspace, I think that's that's important as well. And the other big aspect that we haven't really covered is access right to care and uh, financial implications. So ca cancer cancer treatment wherever you are, it's um, it, it is it is not uh, it can it can be very expensive, especially with all these new technologies. So when it comes to making sure patients get access to to treatment and supportive care. Um, I think that that's uh, very important. So from a healthcare a policy perspective as well. 
point, it's very vital that we understand that it's not just certain specific individuals that should have the privilege to have cancer care. It should be a given that anybody that contracts cancer has access to the available treatments. Uh, Dr. Don, I'd like to ask you as well, uh, when it comes to the future, do you believe you see a positive trend when it comes to accessibility specifically of cancer care? Do you see that happening right now in your field? Definitely, uh, things are moving, but of course, um, there are certain aspects where you know um, uh, things always have to be improved. Yeah. So in terms of accessibility and affordability, you know, um, and the availability, especially you know, of even to um, whenever a new drug is developed, right, there will always be clinical trials, and these clinical trials are. Um, uh, available in certain parts of the world, but not really available in other parts of the world. So it's all these, uh, if we can improve further, you know, to give everyone a chance, you know, to participate in this kind of clinical trials and accessibility to new uh, drugs and all that, then that will be uh, really good. Yeah, so uh, at this point in time, there are still challenges and limitations remain, yeah, especially right. in our part of the world. Exactly, specifically Asia as well. There's quite a lot to develop, uh, considering you know the rest of the different confidence. They might have a different aspect to approach uh, care as well. But here we see a lot of you know demographic. A lot of demographics have access to public health care, but then uh, it's quite uh, you know there's a lot of a difference between how that public health care has been addressed as well, specifically in Sri Lanka, considering as well. Dr. Tanaja, we don't really have uh, much time left. Uh, I'd like to ask you uh, before we leave off. Uh, on this discussion. I'd like to ask Dr. Don as well, but first Dr. Tanuja, is there a specific key message as a medical oncologist you'd like to leave for our audience that's watching you today? Um, anything that you'd like to give as instructions or advice for our audience? I want to, so, so basically to, pay, to, to patients who, who are afflicted with cancer, I, I want to say that cancer is uh, truly difficult. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, it can be a very long and hard journey, but I think um, throughout this, to, throughout this difficult journey, as as a medical oncologist, um, we, st we stand by you, we walk with you, we are here to support you. And truly, cancer is not the end of the road. There is uh, cancer with all the advancements that we have now. Cancer can now be seen more as a chronic disease rather than a terminal disease. And and uh, we, uh, I hope patients get all the help and support that they need. Right, yeah. that's a very hopeful message as well. Dr. Don, anything uh, to leave us off on uh, as the uh, final uh, moments approach? Yeah, I mean, like Dr. Tanuja has mentioned, um, I just want to, you know, just say that um, don't give up. You know, uh, it is, of course, uh, something that uh, no one really wants uh, it to happen. But if it happens, um, there are ways, you know, to come out of it. So don't ever give up and try to seek help, you know, and help is always available and there are people who will walk with them. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that is quite the hopeful message for us to leave this discussion on. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, much time left to discuss. Uh, we will definitely have to catch up in the future. Hopefully we can do a follow up on this as well to educate the audience. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tanaja Rajasekaran, Senior Consultant, Medical Oncology. And thank you very much, Dr. Don Mia, Senior Consultant Hematology, both from the Parkway Cancer Center. It was uh, a treat to actually understand the nuances of cancer with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank so, you. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for you tonight. Join us again next time as we discuss a different topic uh, that relates to you and to me. Well, uh, if you've missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.